Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thomas Hubel is a renowned teacher, author, and international facilitator who integrates the core insights of the great wisdom traditions with the discoveries of science. He has worked with more than 100,000 people worldwide through workshops, multi-year training programs, and online courses. Thomas is also the host of the annual Collective Trauma Summit and the author of the book entitled Healing Collective Trauma, a process for integrating our intergenerational and cultural wounds. Uh, you can find that on Amazon or any bookseller that was released um, late last year. Now let me introduce Terry. Terry Real is a best-selling author and founder of the Relational Life Institute, uh, which offers workshops for couples, individuals, and parents, as, as well as professional training programs for clinicians. Uh, Terry's work is known for its rigorous, common-sense approach, which speaks to both men and women. A proponent of full throttle marriage, Terry has been called the most innovative voice in thinking about and treating men and their relationships in the world today. He's the author of multiple books, including I Don't Want to Talk About It, Overcoming the Secret Legacy of Male Depression, and The New Rules of Marriage, What You Need to Know to Make Love Work. Lovely. Thank you. Okay. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be facilitating this. Um, I... Both of these teachers are just extraordinary and made such an impact in my life. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them for today's presentation on hidden effects of trauma in relationships. And I think you're going to go ahead and start, Thomas. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Richard. First of all, welcome, Terry. I'm happy thank to be you. here with you. We are back again. Always a <laughs> All right. And welcome everybody here on this call. So many people were interested or are interested in this uh, call today. So since we're coming from all over the world and we are coming into this call um, uh, from different daily activities, maybe we'll just take a moment since we talk about trauma. Trauma is being revealed through awareness and uh, often the after effects of trauma don't allow us to get really centered uh, properly in order to take care of it so we can take a minute to just arrive here in the room and and the best way to arrive and center ourselves is our is our body and our breath so maybe we take a moment to just uh, listen and feel into the way we are breathing, or the way you are breathing right now. And, and just take a moment to see wherever you come from to join this class, whatever is going on, the level of activity, the level of stress, also the level of relaxation. And your breath is a perfect guide to connect you to your body. We're going to speak later about okay, what's the nature of trauma and how does trauma affect our lives and our intimate relationships. But trauma in itself lives very much in our body. And, and the healing of trauma is also going through our body. So when you take a moment and see, when you connect to your body and just get a sense of your physical body, the way you're sitting, breathing, And then for a moment, just to slow down the way you exhale a little bit, pro prolong your exhalation. And see if you just enjoy the sensations that you feel in your body. There's a lot of movement going on inside of our bodies, like pulsing, streaming, flow sensations, maybe also stress, maybe some tensions. It's a whole composition.
And then for one moment to check in. What is actually aware of the fact that you feel your body right now? What is the part of you that is aware that you feel yourself? It's the awareness right now. Feeling yourself. Right, and then we can gently open our eyes again, or start with our conversation, Terry. Um, and I think the richest statement uh, was a beautiful reminder of um, also the nature of our intimate relationships. So there is the ideal version of of our life, and then there's the real version of our life. When <laughs> interruptions come in, when uh, trigger moments come in, and so that's what Terry and I are going to talk about. And the reason why I ask you to connect to your body is because what we are sharing today is something that's kind of a longer term practice. It's something that we can get better at that uh, many people who practice awareness practices see not an immediate jump, but the long-term progression. So that awareness and also the part that is aware of our internal process is an amazing resource, same as our body awareness, the way how we learn to center ourselves. And um, just at the beginning, a short um, introduction. So when we hear trauma, we often think of, I don't know, car accidents or a massive abuse, or we think of a war situation. But actually, trauma can be much more subtle than that, and it's still traumatizing. Many of us in the early years of our lives went through overwhelming situations. So a trauma is an o overwhelming situation but it's not the situation that we go through it's what that situation triggers in us so trauma is not the external event it's the internal process that's happening when we are going through a very overwhelming situation and what's happening when we are going through a very overwhelming situation is two things one is that we are super stressed and we, we all might know moments when we come into high levels of stress, also in uh, intimate relationship arguments, where we become very defensive, where we either want to run away or we want to fight. And when that exceeds, when that stress level in a traumatizing situation exceeds that level, so we become frozen. Which means that the real pain in us, the deepest pain, is actually mute. And so one part of us is super stressed and another part in us, like there's, the, there's kind of a fragmentation and we numb the part of us that is so overwhelmed in order to survive better. And that's different for a child at, at age one or a, a child that experiences bullying at school or somebody that has a car accident as a grown-up, of course, the intensity is different, but the process inside is very similar. And what, what I want to point out at the beginning, that when we talk about trauma, we are talking that, that internal process, we are talking about something very intelligent that life learned over thousands and thousands of years. We developed a pro an internal process as humanity. All our ancestors going through overwhelming situations developed in a way a process that is alive in us that protects us. So the trauma response is actually a very intelligent process. But if we don't take care of it properly afterwards, it creates 
a lot of symptoms. And we see those symptoms every time we become highly reactive or defensive or shut down. Then we get triggered by our partners. And then often our partners become the projection surface of stuff that happened way, way earlier in our life. And I know, Terry, you're going to continue from here. So that's, that's a basic definition of trauma. That's, it's, it's very simplified now for the purpose of our conversation today. But maybe, Terry, you can take it from here and uh, yeah, see you, how Tom. that relates to your love. Yeah, work. that's great. I, I just want to say two things. Um, w- when we think about trauma, often we think about catastrophic life and limb kind of trauma, which is real. But as a therapist, I also think about what I call relational trauma, Uh, the kind of, for example, misattunement between parent and child or anger uh, in in the household that repeats over and over and over again. It's not threatening life and limb, but it does tremendous damage, relational trauma. And I also think about the difference between active trauma, which is something that shouldn't be there, anger, control, sexuality, and passive trauma, which is more of an absence. You can be overwhelmed by a parent screaming at you. You can also be overwhelmed with loneliness when a parent isn't with you. So uh, both of those things are traumatic. When we think about trauma, for the most part, We think about the wound. Uh, I call it the wounded child part of us, which is very young when you work with it. And uh, usually about first moments of life to four or five years old. And that part of us, uh, which is very back in the relational uh, brain, the emotional brain, the limbic system and amygdala, that, that part of us is just reacting to what we've had. That's the overwhelm. The the wound in us is always overwhelmed. Between the wound and the wise adult part of us, the uh, prefrontal cortex, the part of us that's here and now and thoughtful and deliberate, is that adaptation, that intelligent adaptation that you were talking about. Uh, And in relationships, what we often see uh, is uh, that uh, the wound in us gets stimulated, but as you say, it's often cut off. We don't feel the wound consciously, or we can feel it for about 10 seconds. And then the adaptive child part of us comes in to take over. So what we see in relationships is rarely... You know, somebody says something and then you just fall apart. What we see in relationships is somebody says something and then you fight or you flee or you fix or you freeze, but you move into your characteristic adaptation that you repeat over and over and over again. It's fueled by the wound, but you don't see the wound. You see the adaptation to the wound. Just to underline what uh, Terry said now is that, first of all, attachment trauma is way more subtle. So even people that at first might say, no, I'm not traumatized, that I would have a second look at least because like we, we might not have a major event in our life that we can classify as a biographical trauma, but Attachment trauma, as you said, Terry, neglect or chronic fight situations in the family systems between the parents, that is a different level of trauma, but it, it still creates a lot of uh, pain inside. And, um, and the attachment process is very fragile, it's very subtle, it's very beautiful, but it needs a lot of sensitivity and openness and relation. And so let's talk a little bit about what is relating because we often talk about relation as if it's a thing there is a relation or there is a marriage it's like a thing it's set but actually now when i look at terry when i look at you if i may so then when i look at terry uh, i see a beautiful friend and but the terry and the friend that i see is happening in my brain Now, 
if the Terry out there and the Terry in my brain are the same, that I don't know. First of all, I don't know. I need to leave space that I see Terry only to a certain extent, given my own past, where I am traumatized, I can't see and feel him. And here we, we are with the next point. Like, there is seeing, I see Terry. My perception is already in my central nervous system. So the, the language of relation is resonance. And resonance needs feeling and sensing. So when I see Terry and feel Terry, it's like when you, you know, all the new streaming technologies, like you watch a movie, either you download your movie and you have it on your hard disk, and then you watch the movie that you already stored on your computer, let's say. Or the more modern version, most probably, is that you stream it on a streaming platform. Like now, the fact that you can listen to us fluidly and it's, it's not getting stuck every 10 seconds, hopefully for you right now. So that means that the data is streaming well. Relation or relating is data streaming. and so. I can update Terry in me moment to moment through data streaming, which means through feeling him. If I feel him, I have a moment to moment update, like a camera that makes many photos, so it becomes a movie. If I, if I get triggered by Terry and I withdraw, I don't feel him anymore. And then Terry in Thomas gets old. I'm looking at an image in myself, not anymore the resonant, updated version of Terry. And that's what we often see because trauma in many ways is being inflicted through inappropriate relations, through relations that were already hurt before. And if, let's say our parents were traumatized, we are growing up in a traumatized uh, family system. And of course, a part of that gets transferred to us. So. Trauma her is being inflicted through inappropriate relation, and it creates a hurt in the process of relating. Because relating means I feel you feeling me. I feel you and how you feel me. That's the music of relation. It's a ding dong, ding dong. That's and when we hit trauma, it's and so that is very important because often we think of relation as a thing as something but actually what really is relating is a data stream online between me and my partner between me and my kids and between me and colleagues at work i feel you feeling me is the basic attachment music and that's called neuroception and neuroception is the basic a sense our body feels if another person feels us. So if I feel you, your nervous system picks up on me feeling you. And that creates a deeper sense of safety. If I don't feel you, your nervous system picks up on that too without your conscious mind even being necessarily aware of it. And it creates already a bit of um, stress. And especially with our kids, and also with us when we were kids, that sensing, I feel you feeling me, is the basic feeling of relational safety. And so I wanted to speak a little bit about, because trauma hurts that process, and often when we are triggered, we can't feel our partner anymore because we feel walled off or retracted. And maybe you want to speak a little bit to how that might look like in, in our daily intimate relationship experience. Yeah, exactly, Thomas. Um, I feel you feeling me. I love that phrase. That is what intimacy is. It's an interpenetration, intersubjectivity. You say something, it goes into me. It kicks around with what I've got. I react to it, and then I say something that goes into you. And it's a living, real-time process. Trauma triggering freezes that process. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, another way of saying it is when you're in the flow of the open system, I feel you feeling me, you're in the prefrontal cortex, you're in the most mature part of your brain, you're in the wise adult part of you. Triggering means that you're going to slip into your adaptive child. 
And when you're in the adaptive child part, one of the bitter pills to swallow is the adaptive child part of us is not interested in I feel you feeling me. The adaptive child part of us is interested in one thing, self-preservation. And so when I get trauma triggered, and then when I slip into my usual adapt adaptation to my trauma, I stop feeling you. And I'm referencing some image that I have of you from way uh, back. We, we speak about this as implicit memory. I have an implicit negative expectation of how you're going to be with me, not based on what's in front of me, but based on what's behind me. I, you know, I've heard you say that in relationships, the greatest gift we give each other is our presence. And you can't be present with somebody if you're not in the presence. And what happens with trauma is that our history overtakes the present. And we are back there. You don't remember trauma, you relive it. And so what happens is a kind of, uh, in relationships, is what I call mutual triggering. Uh, if one of you gets triggered and the other one holds firm, you're in pretty good shape. I, I get to say, uh, everybody in a relationship gets to go crazy, but you have to take turns. So if one of you's off uh, and the other one stays put, that's a good day for you. Uh, if both of you go off, then that's when the difficult, uh, vicious cycle repeats and keeps going on. Mm -hmm. The way mutual triggering works is, so for example, my wife, Belinda, and I both come from fighting families. We both come from fairly violent, critical families. Belinda walks in the door and she goes, I can't believe what a mess it is in here. I immediately get triggered. My wounded child gets triggered. I'm like three or four years old and my big father is standing there yelling at me the way he did. I'm no longer talking to Belinda. I'm that little boy talking to this big towering figure. Uh, my ad, uh, I have about two seconds worth of tolerance for those feelings of helplessness and I get pumped up into my adaptation, which is fight. And I can't believe it. You walk in and you do this. And now, when I get critical of Belinda, guess what happens to her? Her wounded child gets trauma triggered. She's that little girl facing her screaming mother, not me. And her adapt adaptation, her adaptive child comes in to take over, which is fight. We're a symmetrical couple. Fight meets fight. And there we are. When you're in these kinds of vicious uh, circles, you're, uh, it's adaptive child meets adaptive child. The two of you, the real adults, can sit down and have a beer because they're duking it out. It's got nothing to do with you anymore. And so the first skill, I believe, the proto skill, uh, I call relational mindfulness. And I'm sure you're going to have a lot to say about this, Thomas. But the first skill is, and this can be cultivated, is that you take a breath. You realize that you've been triggered, uh, and you bring some. Br I, I've heard you say, "I love this uh, line of yours." Uh, um, in relationships, urgency is our enemy, and breath is our friend. You mm -hmm. take that breath, and you get yourself centered in your body, and you bring yourself out of that triggered adaptive child back into the wise adult part of you. I call this. In real life, remembering love, you uh, you move out of the adversarial me versus you of the adaptive child into the abundant us, the whole of the relationship that the wise adult can appreciate. You remember that the person you're speaking to is not your enemy, but someone you love. Or said differently, you remember the whole, you remember the ecology. Our relationships are like our biospheres. And you remember that this is not a win-lose, zero-sum game. There's enough here for everybody if we can keep centered in the whole, which means getting centered in our own selves. And that's beautiful, Terry. Also, that when we come back, we, we often I often say in, in, the, in the healing work that in doubt, come back to the closest circle of intimacy, which is your self-contact, mm -hmm. you feeling yourself. So if you get triggered in life or if you get unclear or whatever, so I take a breath 
and I see if I can reconnect to my body. And if I can practice that at least five minutes every day in the morning, I mean, the longer the better, but five minutes, my breath is my best friend or one of my best friends because it's with me from day one of the birth. And it's wired in my nervous system ever since. So when I'm breathing, I can get access to my body contact. And my body is the grounding of stress. As you said before, like when trauma gets triggered, there are a few things that usually come with it. I feel separate. There's me and there is you. There's not anymore us. Me and you are over there. Before we were together in a flow. It's very important. Flow states are relational exchange. Me here, you over there, there is usually separation. And that separation is an illusion, but it's so true in that moment because everything in me believes in the trauma fragmentation. It comes with feelings of the past, like fear or shame or anger or other uh, emotional sensations or sensations of numbness so that I simply don't feel myself anymore. And when that happens, I need to come back to a place that I can sense and feel in myself, and then from me to you. Because trauma has another um, uh, symptom that it comes with, that is, I'm speeding up, I'm getting really stressed, I'm getting fast. If I'm getting fast, I need to slow down. And Trauma comes with a sense of scarcity. Every time we hit trauma, it feels like something's not enough. There's not enough for me and there's not enough for you. There's not enough time. There's not enough space. There's not enough something. And, and when we sense that we know this is a symptom, this is not the trauma itself, as you said, Terry. The trauma itself is hidden in our unconscious most of the time. But the sensations that come from that place are very, very strong. Because what we experienced at that time really overwhelmed us. And we become defensive. And those defense mechanisms were intelligent functions that how that was the best that we could do as a kid or at that time to help ourselves. And of course, today it it creates a lot of symptoms in our relationships. And and maybe the last part that is something very tiny but super important i said before me being related to terry right now means me feeling him and when when we hit the trauma in us since in the moment of traumatization something is so overwhelming that we shut down a part of ourselves usually that bridge me being able to feel myself and to feel my surrounding is being hurt or broken. In that moment when the trauma gets triggered, then I can't anymore feel him and me at the same time. And I think when we notice that, we need a practice. And I, I remember when we did our last course last year, you said something very powerful, Terry. You said that you, you spoke about a moment with uh, your wife, with Belinda, uh, and you said there was a moment where you felt either I step into the reactive part or I can stay and witness that reactive part but not go down that route. And, and that moment where like a choice comes back in the when the reactivity kicks in and we have a freedom to not choose that route that's a very powerful function for most of us it comes through a practice and i know you practiced that in your life for many many years so that a moment of choice where it seems like we don't have a choice. We go back to the same argument with our partner again, and we go back to the same argument again. So at that moment to have a choice is really um, very, very, a very powerful fruit of an ongoing practice. And I think that's what you also speak a lot about. I think that's right. It, the hallmark of the a adaptive child part of us is that it's automatic. It's very fast, knee-jerk, fight, flight, 
fix or freeze are the, are the usual. And perhaps those listening could take a moment and just sort of out yourself to yourself. When you're in that reactive state, do you tend to fight? Do you tend to flee? And you can flee while sitting six inches in front of somebody. That's called stonewalling. Do you try and fix it compulsively and make it all better? Or do you freeze? Uh, any of those responses are automatic. The blessing, the grace comes in when you can take a breath, realize that you're triggered, and choose another path. It's only the uh, adult part of us that can do that. The, the adaptive child part of us is too automatic. So we have to get a little bit centered and then make a different choice. I, I always wanted to make a T-shirt for our institute, and on the front it would say something like relational living, and on the back it would say, I choose door B. I know door A with Belinda getting angry at her. I know exactly what lays behind that door. I've been through that door a million times. In this moment, and the work of relationships is in the moment, not day by day. In this moment right now, am I going to choose reactivity and the usual, or am I going to get centered and do something deliberate and different? I choose door B. And more and more as we do this practice, both in our lives, and also I want to say on the pillow, I'll say a moment about that, um, as we make this work, as we strengthen these muscles, then door B becomes more and more available to us. And for the practitioners who are listening to us, the time that you do spend in meditation in the morning or whatever uh, is a kind of a, a big version of what I'm talking about. And when you're facing your partner and they're upset with you and you have that, I call it whoosh, the W-H-O-O-S-A, that wave that comes up of reactivity, the time that you spent meditating will be in, in your favor now because you're having a moment of the same kind of attentional practice, uh, but it's in real time with live ammo with your partner. So I, I don't see the two as um, contradictory. They actually feed on each other and support each other. Right. And, and another great resource um, that we mentioned before is simply the capacity to feel the life parts of our body like the resources in our body that can help us to find a, a self-contact and a moment to slow down and to regulate ourselves. And then, um, and then I want to talk a little bit about, because usually, you know, many people might think, oh, my body is maybe 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. But in fact, my body is hundreds of thousands of years and even millions of years old because that's the time that life needed to develop the model that comes with our lifetime. So what the emotional system, the physical system, our organs, our thinking has been developed over a very long time through our ancestors. And our ancestors went through trauma and we are not the first ones that are healing trauma. So multiple traditions in the past, plus genetic recombination and, and different family systems, like we got traumatized and we already healed trauma in the past. So even if we didn't call it that way. And, and so now here we are with all that wisdom in our being, like our bodies, our emotional systems, our self-healing mechanisms, our nervous systems are highly developed over a very long period of time. And we have access to that wisdom because we are not the first ones living and we're not the first ones hitting relationship difficulties. So there are the resources that come through the ancestral stream to us. And then, of course, like, if my parents or my grandparents or my great grandparents were traumatized and that trauma kind of jumps generations and those tendencies, we call them tendencies because we didn't, I didn't experience the trauma of my grandmother going through the second world war. 
but I might feel the after effects of the stress and or my grandfather's trauma in the Second World War. I might feel the stress or maybe the anxiety or maybe other aspects in my own experience. And so the ancestral transmission of trauma is very important too, because we are sitting, we grew up in a family system that had already tendencies. That wasn't the white sheet of paper that had already many tendencies and imprints that we grew up in, as well as our society around us, our teachers and, and different circles of society. And what I'm saying is that in the process of healing ourselves, not only when we heal something in ourselves, we actually also send a ripple effect back in time into our ancestral tree. But we also sometimes try to deny, no, I don't want to look back and examine our ancestors and uh, like my grandparents and great grandparents' lives because I think it's too much for me and I, I'm just looking forward. But everything that I deny in my past, it's only the past because it's split off. Otherwise, it would be integrated life here. Every time we integrate trauma, it becomes learning. Every time we leave trauma unexamined, examined, we, we actually carry that past with us. And of course, the examination and the, the, the integration process needs to be appropriate, but denying the past just keeps it living. It doesn't disappear on its own. It needs us. That's why that's also part of our purpose. Our life purpose is not only our career and where we are going to and how creative we are, our life purpose is also integrating the legacy that has been handed off to us. So what our, what our ancestors didn't take care of is now in our hands. Mm. And, and we are walking with that, and we can either, either pass it on as well, or we can say, okay, that's part of my life, and that's part of my life purpose, and I'm going to be the one that is going to look. I'm going to look step by step as I can with the support that I have available to examine that and to stop that process of passing it on to the next generations. And maybe Terry, maybe you want to speak a little bit about that too, about the ancestral transmission that uh, it didn't yeah. start just with us. As a family therapist, I'd learned uh, from my early training about what we call multi-generational uh, legacies. You know, the uh, grandfather was a rager, great-grandfather was a rager, father was a rager, the sister marries a rager, uh, how these things get passed on. And uh, what I came to realize is that the actual mechanism of the transmission is trauma. Like my father was uh, violent. And when he was being violent toward me, it, he was both disempowering me on the receiving end I was shamed and made small, but he was also transmitting a message that this is what a grown man looks like when he gets angry, and this is okay. These legacies of both shame and grandiosity, both inferiority and superiority, get passed on generation to generation. In fact, I have a quote, if I may quote myself. Uh, they say it's pretentious to do that, but I, I always quote this quote. It's from uh, my first book. I don't want to talk about it. Family pathology rolls from generation to generation like a fire in the woods, taking down everything in its path until one person in one generation has the courage to turn and face the flames. That person brings peace to his ancestors and spares the children that follow. I think that's exactly what you were uh, just talking about. Beautiful. Work, and when I work with people, I, I often tell them, this work is not just for you. This work is for the generations. Um, there's a couples therapist who asks people to bring in pictures of their kids and lines up the pictures of the kids. And as the couple works on their relationship, she says, just remember, they're watching. 
So our past and our future is combining in this moment of now. And in this moment of now, what am I going to choose? Door A or door B? And door B is healing for me, my children, the generations that follow, and my ancestors who came behind. Yeah, and that's literally, like, that's so beautiful, like, also how you uh, framed it with the fire and the woods, that because it also feels like that whenever we feel that pain, what we want to do is get away from it. Mm -hmm. That's also the, the nature of all our protection mechanisms is to feel less pain. And that's very intelligent in moments where we got really overwhelmed. But I think we can support each other And, and, you know, we have some superpowers. One superpower is present and presence and the present. Like really feeling you right now is a superpower. Mm -hmm. And I often say when, um, let's say a small child comes to you and says, Terry, Terry, uh, I'm really scared. And then let's say you say, either you say, oh, you don't have to be scared. There's no, there's no danger. But what you did is you created, you devalued the emotional need of the child. You gave the child a rational answer when it came with an emotional request and you created the distance. Mm -hmm. The other is a child comes to you and says, Terry, Terry, I'm really scared. And you say, you turn to the child and you say, yes, I feel you're scared. Come to me mm -hmm. and let's have a look together. What's the difference? I create, I felt my child, I feel you feeling me. So I feel you. I create emotional resonance. I feel my child is stressed and scared. So I say, I create emotional resonance. Before I give any rational answer, I meet the emotional need. It creates emotional resonance. The child can come with its USB plug to the grown-up person or to your grown-up nervous system, plug into your heart, into your vagal nervous system, and in that moment, co-regulation starts to happen. And, and the child can land, down-regulate its stress, and then you say, okay, let's have a look what's really happening. And then rational leadership comes in. Rational leadership or parental guidance, or that's also true for any leadership function in the world, needs to come in, but not when the nervous system of the other person is like that, but when there's co-regulation and a, a certain sense of regulation in the nervous system, then the, the rational uh, guidance is very, very helpful and it needs to come in, but not Uh, by creating an emotional distance. And I think the, that kind of relational resonance is one of our superpowers too. So as you said beautifully before, if one of us, one of the partners has still enough resources available to feel the partner when the partner gets triggered, that's amazing because then there is still, there is a progress possible because we are not traumatized on the same place. So when one gets triggered, the other one is in a pretty good shape. That's, that's great. But you also said, and I, I want to highlight that when both carry trauma on the same level and there are not enough resources, we responsibility means not that we have to do it alone, but then somebody needs to come to you or someone like you and say, listen, we really need help because if we don't have the resources in the system, we can't, go further on that level because the resources are like the water in the river. If there is still water carrying the weight of an object in the river, so the, the, the object will keep flowing in the river. But if the object is too heavy or there's not enough water in the river, it's going to get stuck. So some couples might get stuck by not bringing in the support that's needed to resolve that tight part because both Both don't have enough water available on that level of their development. And so I think I want to just highlight what you said before, because there's a meaning that reaching out is important if 
in the system of the relation of the couple, it's not possible to resolve a certain pattern and it's, it's going to continue like that. I think that's exactly right. Um, we're going to break for questions in a minute. I just wanted to say that same um, healing resonance that you describe so beautifully between an adult and a child. Uh, we're going to do this in the course. We're going to do some live work with, with folks. But um, in terms of our own healing, you can bring that same resonance to the less mature parts of ourselves, to the wounded child and adaptive child parts of ourselves. And in our work, we often extract those, we personify those younger parts of ourselves. And you can be empathic and compassionate to those young parts of you. One of the things I say, Thomas, is you don't meet harshness with harshness. There's nothing that harshness does that loving firmness doesn't do better. So if it's an adaptive child that's creating havoc through anger or control, Yes, you need to set limits, but firmly and lovingly, these are young parts of yourself. And you can learn some self-compassion even as you deal with these parts. Beautiful. Yeah, maybe we, we see if, uh, if uh, Richard has some questions that came in. So maybe we can spend the last 10 minutes looking at questions. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh we have a ton of just amazing questions. I always feel when I'm on these calls, I'm on a time warp with Thomas and Terry here <laughs> because <laughs> it's so engaging. Uh, so let me, uh, we'll just jump into some of the questions here. We'll probably just have time for a queue, uh, a few. A quick reminder, Thomas and Terry are going to be doing an ongoing course. This is going to be over 10 hours of material. Um, that's going to start on April 15th, and we will send you an email. Um and uh, if you're an alumni from last year's course, uh, you'll get a, a different deal because it, it includes uh, the course you did last year or they, that they did last year. Um, or you can email us at online course support at thomashubel.com. Um, or you can also go to the website lovetraumahealing.com and you can get the full uh, list of the course this year. It's really incredible. Uh, can't wait for that. Okay, first question comes from Vanessa. And I think it's a really good question that has been asked numerous times in the Q&A. Will anything change in your relationship if your partner doesn't identify except his own trauma um, he went through growing up? Yeah, you know, um, if you don't face your history, you tend to repeat it. Uh, there's a saying in AA, hurt people hurt people. And this is how the transmission keeps going uh, forward. So if, if someone denies their trauma, the odds are it will be stimulated. They, they won't uh, have that resonance between themselves and these parts of themselves. And they'll, the, the adaptive child will take over and make trouble for you in your, uh, in your relationship. That's not your problem. However, it's your partner's problem. And uh, there's only so much you can do to try and control the situation. You stay focused on your practice. And uh, if your partner does well uh, in response to your practice, that's a beautiful day for both of you. If your partner, as Thomas was saying earlier, if your partner is, uh, goes off the rails and you don't jump into the mud pit with them, you, you you will get the whoosh. You will get adaptive child triggered, but you take a breath and get recentered. That's a mixed day for the relationship, not a great day for your partner, but a splendid day for you. I call this relational integrity. You work on your own practice on your side of the street and uh, feel the satisfaction of that. You may not always get the partner you want, but you can get the you that you're searching for. Mm. right and and beautiful and just uh maybe to add to that and i think if if you do the practice that terry suggested now then there there is like we we it looks like often that our partner doesn't xyz but deeper down uh, i often say you know in the first moment of getting into a relation all the information was there but we weren't fully there. The relationship 
or the marriage is the time to find out what we didn't see in the first moment. So it means that it reveals itself over, you know, after we fell in love and after the hormones slowly subside and the real relationship shows up, then we see, wow, there are parts that are less flowing than we thought at the beginning. But this is also where my trauma and my wife's trauma are connected. Mm -hmm. So if one partner keeps healing and healing and healing, so then, first of all, as Terry, you said beautifully, then there are more resources and the internal state of that person is, is growing. And then it will show itself how that relation will either reorganize itself into a new relation and will also create a relational growth impulse for the partner. Or maybe at a certain level, that relation can't continue because the, the developmental gaps are simply going to be too strong. But important is often my trauma and my partner's trauma have a kind of a lawyer agreement and as long as we don't decipher the agreement that we signed unconsciously on that level, there is something that uh, might be stuck. And it's through the healing process, we are actually finding out what that was. And then there is a reorganization of the relationship anyway happening. Yeah, a friend of mine, Esther Perel, says, uh, I expect to have six marriages in my lifetime, and I hope they are all to the same man. <laughs> it's, part of, it's part of the flow huh? that you transform and that challenges the partner in the relationship then the relationship transforms to be big enough to hold your growth and that's what makes it alive and exciting exactly lovely awesome that's great uh here's another question from nora and she's asking how do I distinguish a disharmonious relationship due to trauma from simply a relationship that doesn't fit or isn't meant to be? And there was a few other questions around that same kind of theme. Hmm. Terry, you want to go again? I think, I think it's in the, I don't think it matters uh, because if you're stuck, what that, if you're not, congruent what that means is that your partner's uh, adaptive child doesn't work very well with yours because th that's where the rubber hits the road uh, or that one of you is moving beyond the adaptive child to the wise adult and the other one is just playing it out over and over and over again so i, I don't think it matters whether it's a kind of constitutional mismatch or a trauma-driven uh mismatch the, the question is, what can you do about it? Can, if you change your behavior on your end of the seesaw, uh, does that change things between the two of you? If that change is workable, you've got a good relationship. If no matter how much you change on your side, your partner stays stuck, then you have to really take a good look at why you're there. Get some right. help first uh, and then take a look. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think what you said now is very important. We don't have to struggle alone. You know, there's nowhere written in the universe, you need to resolve everything alone, or we need to resolve things alone. But there is, since we are all embedded in a web of life, in a, in, in a much wider collective intelligence, making use of that collective intelligence in moments when we feel under-resourced is very important. That's actually able to respond. If we are stuck with each other, we need to bring a resource in that helps us to keep on moving. Because what feels so painful often, if we feel we are not moving together anywhere, the fact that it's uncomfortable, there's a, there's a discernment in my understanding between moving along and struggling and struggling on the same place. And I think if you if don't, if you're struggling, but there's no water in the river to carry us further, then it's not about, it might be the same discomfort, but one couple is, is still cruising along somehow while struggling and another couple might be really stuck and there are not enough resources. And that's where we have to bring somebody in. Otherwise, we are just burning our life energy and we are burning our health over the long run, on the long run. And then we, we and that's, that's where it's the stagnation is, needs the help the most. So what you said, Terry, 
bringing support in is very important. And the other one is clarity is clarity. When it's clear, it's clear that it's clear. When it's not clear, it's clear that it's not clear. And that's, so when, whenever I have that question, if it's the right relation or not, I, all I know is that I'm not clear about it. So I need a reflection in order to gain more clarity. So that's very, very powerful. So then I, I know I need to look at it. Otherwise, most probably I will take that on clarity anyway to any other relationship okay. as well. I have one closing question if you'd like to hear that, because uh, we're right on the top of the hour. Um, and uh, they're just... There's, the question is, curious to know how each of you feel about the ability to, to move beyond trauma and triggers. Can we eventually be in our mature adult bodies, alive with feelings and intelligence, me living as a fully feeling, untraumatized being? So what's kind of the vision for where this work can go, I think, is the question. Hmm. Well, we, I don't know. You know, therapists and spiritual teacher, we may have different points of view on this. I think that it's always with us. I think our wounded child and our adaptive child will always be there. As we heal, they will be less intense. Uh, we will be able to form a relationship with them and be intimate with them and parent them. Uh, it, which is guiding them, limiting them, and being nurturing uh, to them. But these young parts of us are always for us to manage. One of the things I say is maturity is dealing with your own inner children and not foisting them off on your partner to deal with. The dealing with them gets easier as the traces of them get lighter as you do your work. But I believe they're always there. What, what do you say, Thomas? Yeah, it depends. I, I I think it it might be always there, and it might also be that we will loosen up step by step throughout our healing process. And the the important part I would say also in that question is is that trauma that the notion or let's say a symptom of trauma is that I would love to be somewhere else. Hmm. To think about the ideal version of myself, like how I would look like when I'm trauma healed, is already part of the symptom because I can't be here. And that's why I would say, I don't think it matters so much if that place will be healed one day or not. More is what helps us to really embody ourselves more and to meet those parts, but with a with a higher or more or a deeper awareness. And then see if we can every time we transform a layer of trauma into I often say there are three words that, that describe it. It's reflect, becoming aware that there is a trauma, digest digest the past in order to be able to integrate the past into post-traumatic learning. And so we will see how much is really possible to be integrated and learn, but every step we do strengthens the part that Terry talks about is this, uh, the grown-up, mature, more wise part of us. So if it will be entirely healed or not, I don't think is really the question. The question is, do I sign up? to be that process? And I think that's that's the question. Am I willing to be that process and find out? Am I going to be intimate with myself? Yeah. Uh, someone asked Phil Kaplow, when you're enlightened, are you still neurotic? And he said, you know, before I did my spiritual work, it was my neuroses. And now it's like, my neuroses. <laughs> 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 that's someone who's done their work. 